Hello, I'm Tom Stapledon, and I've got another talk on Joseph Williamson. Uh, we've done a fair bit on Joseph Williamson already and um, his time in Edge Hill and his tunnels. Uh, this time I thought we'd have a look at a little uh, of the background as to how Joseph Williamson uh, came up to live in Edge Hill. And uh, I'm going to couple it with the story of another gentleman whose life seems to have run in a fairly parallel sort of way, uh, interestingly. And uh, I want to uh, give credit here before I start to uh, one of our uh, superb researchers, Don Hyam, who has done so much work uh, over so many years from the, the late 1990s in uh, unearthing these stories. And most of what I have to say comes directly from the research work of Don Hyam. It certainly isn't my own. And um, Don is one of those researchers who has been uh, delving into the depths in libraries and record offices in Liverpool and in Preston and going through dusty papers and finding the information that was needed. So um, credit to Don for all the work he's done there. Um, this story is going to concern another gentleman called Edward Mason, um, who ended up in Edge Hill, um, along with Joseph Williamson. Um, they were both uh, successful and wealthy merchants in Liverpool, although uh, Mr. Mason was about uh, was more than 30 years ahead of Joseph Williamson in age. Edward Mason was a wealthy Liverpool merchant who owned a number of timber yards and supplied timber to shipbuilders and house builders down in the town. Uh, he was also the part owner of at least one ship himself, uh, possibly more. Um, he was also a very generous benefactor to all the major charities in the town. It's, uh, it's well documented that he was very uh, closely involved with the new St. James's Church in uh, Parliament Street, and um, also uh, very closely involved in the setting up of uh, schools that were, were run by that church. Um, but he was, he, was, he was a really big benefactor in all sorts of ways. Um, he started speculating in land in the 1770s around the area where he lived down in town. Uh, the, the town of Liverpool was quite a small place at that time. Uh, timber merchants were not encouraged to have timber yards close to the city of town, uh, close to the centre of town, because of the dangers of fire, uh, which could spread to the docks, uh, among other places. So his timber yards tend to be more around the, uh, the Baltic Triangle and uh, the Wapping area. That's, where, I believe, where he lived, and he also started speculating in land in that area. So Edward Mason was born in 1735. That's more than 30 years before Joseph Williamson, uh, who was born in 1769. But as I say, their, their lives seem to have followed a very similar path in some respects. Um, Mr. Mason obviously was seeing how the wealthy merchants of the town were looking to move out to live in nicer areas. This probably included himself. Um, a new town of Harrington had been laid out in the uh, 1770s. That was the brainchild of a man called Cuthbert Bisbrown. He was, uh, he was not a wealthy merchant or anything. He was a carpenter, but he had a vision and he wanted to uh, create a new town just outside of Liverpool. And uh, it was going to be called Harrington. A uh, great plan. He managed to acquire land from the Lord of the Manor. Uh, got various people to uh, go into partnership with him and invest in this idea. But uh, he got it all wrong. Mistakes were made and it all fell flat. Um, this new town never materialised, but in the end, it turned out to be where um, Toxteth was eventually uh, created. Uh, not what his plans uh, were at all, but there you go. Um, now then... Um, People in the town were also looking up the hill to the east, expanding up uh, out of the city. And uh, this old plan, 1823, I think it is, by uh, Walker, uh, shows here uh, Pembroke Place leading up out of the old town. Uh, up here we have, uh, we have Paddington, um, Mount Vernon, I think it is. And um, this area... Um, 
in those days, it was known as uh, either Cheatham's Hill or Chetham's Hill. Uh, the name of Edge Hill didn't arrive until about 1800. Uh, beyond this area here was the, this was the Moss Lake, uh, a wet, boggy area that was a, a pretty much a no man's land. And the um, city council had built a reservoir there, I think. But he was, he was looking beyond that up onto this rocky outcrop on the top of the hill. And um, his first lease, Mr. Mason's first lease, was a piece of land here bordered by Mason Street, Paddington and Smith Down Lane. That was not known as Mason Street, by the way. It didn't have a name in those days. It was just a little country lane, which just served a couple of houses and the farms, and it didn't have anything, anything uh, much there at all. It was actually named after him eventually. So he took out a lease on this quite large plot of land from the West Derby Wastelands Commission. The West Derby Wastelands was an organisation that was set up to administer all of the lands in the area um, in West Derby that were of no great value. After the Enclosures Act, the, um, the peasantry could no longer uh, use that land and graze it. They, um, the, the land was all in the hands of the uh, landed gentry, if it was any good. And the stuff that was not much use for anybody else uh, was put in the hands of the West Derby Wastelands Commission. It was a national organisation and it was run from London, had a commissioner, but the, the West Derby Wastelands had their own committee that ran their local affairs. And if they could manage to find anybody who was uh, willing to uh, lease a piece of land to build a house or whatever, then uh, they would lease land out. And um, any rents that they received, um, any profits from the rents they received went towards um charities for the poor so it served a purpose um now then um this piece of land that mr mason leased here first in uh, 1792 that's not the whole of it uh, his house is off to the left there um that was called the long broom field on cheatham hill um we're not quite sure where that name came from, but uh, it was quite a large plot of land. And he, um, within the next couple of years, I believe, uh, put up a quite a large mansion house on the bottom corner of that piece of land, on the corner of Paddington and Smith Down Lane, just off the map here, with large stables, and then the rest of it was all gardens. Now, this plan uh, shows all these uh, green boxes, which are uh, areas of land that Mr. Mason leased from the West Derby Wastelands Commission, all along Mason Street here. He may have leased a lot more lands apart from these, but we were interested in this particular area because this is where Joseph Williamson ended up uh, with these same leases. Um, so we, we don't know how extensive um, Mr. Mason's leases were, but he certainly took out all of these along here. Now, uh, after a few years, his new neighborhood was starting to build up a little bit. Uh, more people were moving in, houses were being built, and uh, Mr. Mason decided that he would like to build a church for this new neighbourhood. As I say, he was uh, a generous benefactor, uh, and it was around 1805 that Mr. Mason approached Lord Salisbury, Salisbury, who was the, um, the major landowner around here, and he approached him about purchasing land to build a church. Now, this, uh, this area here is the plot of land that he had in mind. And this spot here is right on the top of the, the hill. By 1800, it had be, become known as Edge Hill. And that's the spot that he chose where he would like to build a church. Uh, I think Lord Salisbury was not particularly happy. He knew the value of his land and um, he didn't really want to sell it to uh, Mr. Mason, but I think he may have felt morally obliged to let it go at a cheaper price than he knew it was worth. I don't know how long it took him to make his decision to sell, but he did eventually give in and he sold this large plot of land to Mr. Mason at a, a much reduced price to what he knew it was actually worth, only because he knew that Mr. Mason was going to build a church on it. So this is what happened. Uh, but it took some time. As I say, I don't know how long it took um, Lord Salisbury to decide to sell the land. But the church started 
uh, with the foundation stone being built in uh, being laid sorry in um, January of 1812 and the church was completed by the end of October the following year 1813 which is good going only about 21 months from laying the foundation stone to the completion of the church quite good um, I think that was really quite an achievement um, unfortunately though Mr Mason didn't get to see his plans fulfilled for this nice new neighborhood he was creating because he died the very next year in May 1814 he only lived a few more months to see uh, see his church complete but not much else unfortunately if you look at this plot of land here where he's built the church um, the church has got a nice uh, large area around it for a graveyard and this area here became where the um, vicarage was built but look at all this lot all this was surplus to requirements for the church but he got it at a knockdown price so he was in profit here he didn't get to do anything with it himself but um, he had one daughter surviving at his death uh, that was um, Ellen Mason. She herself was quite a shrewd businesswoman, I believe. She learned everything she knew from her father. Uh, she followed him very closely and she carried on. Uh, she inherited his entire estate. She was the executor of his estate and she carried on uh, doing good works all around the town in the same way that her father had done. So whether uh, Ellen Mason sold off all this land to um, developers to build on or whether she had it built on herself, I'm afraid we're never going to know. Mr. Mason, being a shrewd businessman, um, and not just a ben this was not just a benevolent act uh, to build a church for the district, but uh, in the process, he obtained two acts of parliament. The first one was to build the church in this spot, but the second one was to be allowed to appoint a minister. This also allowed him to sell or rent pews in the church and plots in the graveyard so um, there was a good bit of income to come from this uh, from which he stood to take make a, a percentage of the profits so he was always the businessman no matter how benevolent he was i think all businessmen are they don't get rich by uh, being daft or soft so uh, that was uh, quite a good move um this map uh, sorry this this is probably the last of the plans i'm going to show you i think um this shows a stretch of mason street again and this time um this has been labeled up by don don hyam these are all the plots of land that joseph williamson has now acquired he came up here in about 1806 after um mr mason coming up in 1792 and I can't tell you exactly what's happened. There's a possibility that Mr. Mason only took out short leases, 10-year leases, should we say, on these plots of land on Mason Street, and then they reverted back to the West Derby Wastelands. Or it could be that Joseph Williamson started taking over Mr. Mason's leases from him. We'll never really know the answer to that one. But by this time, Joseph Williamson has acquired a lot of leases and plots of land along Mason Street, and he started building on it. Let's just have a look at this, get away from the plans. Um, this is quite a nice little drawing. It uh, allegedly dates from 1829, but I've also seen it attributed to 1827, but it's that era. Uh, this is the bottom end of Wavertree Road, looking down towards Paddington there and looking down towards Irvine Street there, where, there, where the two roads fork. And St Mary's Church looking quite uh, new without any big trees growing around it yet or anything like that. Uh, still quite a quaint little uh, country village, but starting to build up, of course. I'm throwing this one in just because I like it. This is a photograph I'm going to guess might be from somewhere around the 1890s. Um, this area uh, close to the church where Irvine Street and Paddington come up to meet Wavertree Road uh, is a bit of a a triangle of land now um, in those days it looks like there was a, a circle in the middle of the road and it's called Holland Place it still has the same name it looks like a taxi rank 
um, at this point. The uh, uh, cabbies are all waiting for their fares, people wanting to uh, take a run down into the town, I suppose. And uh, I think this has got a spattering of snow on the ground. It seems to be, to me, uh, that these must be uh, wheel tracks, but I don't think it's, um, um, I don't think they're uh, tram tracks. I'm pretty sure there are no signs of trams here yet, although in, in later years, the trams would be trundling up Irvine Street, uh, going around the circle and then going back down Paddington, the other side. Both streets were too narrow for uh, two-way trams. And uh, this, this would have been covered in uh, poles and uh, overhead cables if, uh, if it was any later, I think. Nice picture though, with the church looking pretty much as it does now. There she is. The church doesn't appear to have changed in any way as far as I can see. It's been said that uh, later historians uh, rather lamented the fact that Mr. Mason had missed a trick by building a plain brick church when he could have built something much more impressive in this superb position. This really was a, a lovely spot right on the top of uh, Edge Hill. Uh, I think it's one of the two highest churches in Liverpool. I think St George's in uh, Everton is just uh, fractionally higher, but it's still a superb spot. And they thought he should have built something far better. Um, but there you go. Um, he had an eye to um, uh, making a profit all the time and perhaps building a brick church like that, which he did in 21 months, was quicker and easier than uh, building a church out of stone. Remember, there was stone being quarried all the way around here, but they've only used a few bits of sandstone embellishment around the outside, but it's nearly all brick otherwise. Meanwhile, Joseph Williamson had acquired all these um, uh, plots of land uh, along Mason Street and perhaps others as well from about 1806, and he started building all these strange and wonderful houses of his all along Mason Street. I've shown you these photos, uh, sorry, these uh, paintings before, but they're, they're always worth looking at. Joseph Williamson's house is there with the arched front and the three side windows. And um, again, same thing again there, three side windows, rather strange, but he's done this more than once, set of the buildings being in line, they're all staggered for some reason. And then you've got this, uh, this painting here, uh, always been a bit of an anomaly, this one. Uh, there were people in the past, um, uh, many years ago, who uh, researched Williamson and were absolutely convinced that this was Joseph Williamson's mansion house. Because it's the most impressive looking building or set of buildings on Mason Street, they just assumed that this was the one that he lived in. But it wasn't. He never lived here. His house was off to the left of this. And it isn't one house. It's a cluster of houses, as I've explained before. Take a look at this one. This is the vicarage of St. Mary's Church, Edge Hill. There's the tower of the church hidden behind the trees there. I think it's quite a, a nice looking house in a way, but it's certainly odd. Uh, it has this enormous great bay window on one side only. Only goes up to first floor level. Looks slightly out of place. Nice tall Georgian windows here. What are these two little brick inserts at the top? They're not even pretending to be windows. They're almost in the roof space. Uh, can't be seriously anything to do with um, the window tax, trying to make it look better, but without actually putting windows in, because they're not even window, no, no window sills or anything. Uh, and then look at this end wall, great expanse of brickwork with no windows in it, and then just this one long window to one side, and um, this one half in the roof space. What's that all about? I'm not at all sure that I know what's happening here, but there are definite similarities with that group of buildings on Mason Street. Take a look at the other end. This is the, the far end wall looking across the graveyard. Big expanse of brickwork again, one small window there only, and that nice little uh, semicircular window almost in the roof space and strange uh, chimney breasts as well. I can't say I understand what's going on there, but bearing in mind that um, Mr. Mason died just months after completing the church and before having the opportunity to build his vicarage, who did build it? I wonder, did Miss Mason commission Joseph Williamson's men to build the vicarage for her? 
which might explain why it's of a similar style to that cluster of buildings in, in Mason Street. If that isn't what happened, then did another builder build those houses in Mason Street and the vicarage? Somebody equally crazy to Joseph Williamson with his uh, odd building style. I just can't make sense of it. Please let me know what you think. Now, going forward sometime, this is 1916. Look what's happened to Mason Street. We're looking up the street, similar angle to where we were before. This is um, number 52 and 50 Mason Street up against the railway cutting. Uh, these houses of Joseph Williamson have now become um, a uh, clothing factory from uh, a company called Zeff and Co, who were uh, uh, making underwear. Further up the street, Joseph Williamson's own house was occupied by um, uh, a secondhand machinery store. All the rich merchants who were living in that area up to 1840 as neighbours of Joseph Williamson had um, beaten their retreat um, quite some time ago and gone off to live in nicer places because not too long after Williamson's time in the 1840s, mass influx of um, uh, immigrants into Liverpool, all the Irish after the famine and lots more besides. And um, the, um, the city was being rapidly expanded to cope with the, the extra population. And this area on the eastern side of um, uh, Mason Street was uh, covered in uh, courthouses, uh, which were the worst of the worst slums eventually. And so it went very rapidly downhill. This is the other side of the street, the east side of Mason Street, looking back down towards the scene we were looking at uh, a minute ago. Uh, you can see how run down that looks. That's also 1916. Um, this is uh, one I'm rather glad to have. Uh, it's the only photograph I've uh, come across, I think. Uh, a part of Joseph Williamson's house, allegedly taken in 1928 by Charles Hand, the local historian that I've talked about many times before. This is the uh, end of Joseph Williamson's house with those three side windows, number 40 and 42. And this is number 44, Mason Street, which became the um, machinery store. The, the name is there over the door. Uh, this was uh, owned by a Mr. Samuel Jones, who ran this secondhand machinery store in the buildings. And he, he had the building through the 1920s and eventually sold it at the end of 1935 to uh, PM Williamson's, the garage uh, people, who promptly knocked the whole lot down, 40 to 44, uh, just leaving the frontage of Joseph Williamson's own house and uh, put up more modern buildings all over the site. And um, I'm glad to have this photo because it's the only one I've got. And this area now is where the gates and fence at the entrance to our Williamson House site now stand. Uh, back up to uh, the top of Edge Hill, uh, you can see there, um, again, the church is built almost entirely of brick. Uh, I think it's a very pleasing looking church, but uh, it does make you wonder because uh, just take a look back at this map again. This is the 1823 Walkers map. The church is there, and you may not be able to read it, but that whole area there, it says stone quarry. So they're quarrying the stone out, literally within spitting distance of where he built his church. And just across the road here at the top of Paddington, good old Joseph Williamson was cutting out the stone down to 60 feet below grounds, as well as in many other areas around his, uh, his empire here. There was no shortage of good building stone, but he's chosen to build his church almost entirely from, uh, from brick. Slightly odd. Um, that little road that curves around the east end of the church is uh, now named Towerland Street. And this, this is the, uh, the Georgian houses that were built on Towerland Street probably in the 1820s, after the quarries had been filled in. They're in good order, these houses. They're really, uh, really in, in, in nice condition. Uh, it's quite a pretty little area because um, this part of Edge Hill is, uh, is now um, a conservation area. I think it's, it's uh, very, very pretty. And 
it's a credit really to the people who who live there that they've kept it in such nice order it's only a small area but it, it really does look nice uh, if we continue uh, along Towland Street and go round the top of the church, past the vicarage, uh, we're going to North View, and uh, down the side of North View here, all those houses have been built on the land that Mr. Mason acquired from Lord Salisbury. Turn the corner to the left, beyond that red car, and we'll be round into Irvine Street, and back slightly up the hill again towards the church, and all these houses have all been built on that land. So who made the big profits? I don't know. But Mr. Mason got a good deal when he bought that land cheaply from Lord Salisbury. And uh, Miss Mason, who uh, took over the running of uh, her father's estate, will have made quite a profit one way or the other, whether she developed this land herself or whether she just sold it on to other people who developed it. We'll never really know. Uh, but uh, there was money made there at the expense of uh, Lord Salisbury. So uh, he, he got a really good deal. And there's the church as it stands now. Uh, and the, the story really uh, around these two gentlemen who uh, both started off uh, in, uh, in business. One was a timber merchant, one was a tobacco merchant down in the town and made lots of money, branched out into other areas, saw the possibility of um, speculating in land as, um, as the gentry were wanting to move out of the old town. And they both did the same thing. As I say, Mr. Mason was a few years ahead, but Joseph Williamson carried on in similar style. Joseph Williamson um, fortunately managed to live a little longer and see this area built up a bit more than poor old Mr. Mason. But Mr. Mason was 79 when he died, so um, just a shame that he didn't see a bit more of it. But there you go. So two lives that ran uh, sort of in a similar parallel way to a certain extent, but both ending up in the same place. So that's about all I've got to show you. Thank you. Thank you for watching.